Well, good morning, everyone. Before I get into our announcements around housing assistance uh, today, I want to take a moment to talk about how far we've come with testing over the last few months. A strong testing program is important in maintaining the progress we've made to slow the spread of the virus while we restart Vermont. It's through testing and contact tracing that we can find those infected early on, trace their contacts, surround clusters before they turn into outbreaks, or I've, as I've described, contain outbreaks before they spread like wildfire. Our ability to do this is a team effort. And I want to acknowledge the commitment of those individuals, organizations, and businesses who are contributing to these efforts, which again are critical to keeping Vermont healthy and open. The health department has taken the lead, but involves many others <coughs> as well. Healthcare providers refer patients for tests. Hospitals are regularly doing testing. The health department response teams coordinate testing in long-term care and correctional facilities. And with our National Guard, we've opened up pop-up test sites at locations throughout the state. These sites have proven to be very helpful and are doing a great job at containing the community outbreaks we've seen. But we can always use more hands on deck because as we've seen throughout the country, the virus is still with us and will be until a vaccine is widely available. That's why community partners are going to be incredibly valuable in our work to provide routine testing across the state for the long term. Many have already stepped up and I want to thank them, including Kinney Drugs in Newport. Uh, starting Monday and each Monday through July, they will offer testing as part of a pilot project. And Walgreens in Essex will also be offering testing for its customers later this month. I know others are considering doing the same, so right now I'm asking Vermont's pharmacies and their parent companies to move as quickly as possible to join in this effort for their customers, staff, and all Vermonters. I also want to recognize the state's health care providers for their testing and referral efforts. These folks on the front lines have made an incredible difference, but their additional commitment to patient testing is also needed especially for those in quarantine or have been exposed. Vermonters can find out more, including how to register for one of the test sites at healthvermont.gov slash COVID-19 testing. As I've said many times, this pandemic has impacted almost every aspect of our lives in every sector of the economy and probably, probably will for the foreseeable future. And housing is no different. Landlords, renters, homeowners, and those experiencing homelessness have all been impacted by this virus and need some help. That's why from the very beginning, we worked with the legislature to provide support and protections for renters and acted quickly to provide housing for our homeless population. And it's why the economic recovery package we proposed to the legislature included funding to help those unable to pay rent and the landlords not receiving it. It also included assistance for homeowners struggling to pay their mortgages and resources to support those struggling with homelessness. My team at the Department of Housing and Community Development and the Agency of Human Services worked closely with the legislature to address these critical needs and passed two bills with housing initiatives. I want to thank Senator Sorokin and Representative Stevens and their committees in the House and Senate for working with us to provide this much needed relief. In total, 85 million in CRF funds will be dedicated to housing assistance. Today, we're able to announce the availability of two of these funding programs, which will support tenants unable to pay rent, landlords suffering from a loss of rent payments, and those lower income homeowners who can't pay their mortgage because of the impacts of this pandemic. Now I know many Vermont families and landlords are struggling and this won't be enough and won't address all their needs, but we'll continue to look for ways to support them so they can survive this once in a century crisis. It's critical we keep moving forward so we can recover as a state and nation and recovery starts with everyone having a safe 
and secure place to call home. Our announcements today cover just a portion of the housing support pass and we'll be highlighting other programs at future press conferences as well. So at this point, I'll now have uh, Josh Hanford, Housing and Community Development Commissioner, share more details on the rental and mortgage assistance programs we're highlighting today. Josh, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Governor. We all know how important having a safe, secure, and affordable place to call home is. This pandemic has highlighted that more than ever. The stay safe, stay home has become part of our everyday language. Months ago, uh, months ago now, an eviction and foreclosure moratorium was put in place to ensure families had that safe place to stay, regardless of their ability to pay the rent or the mortgage bill. This was necessary to ensure families were not forced into homelessness or doubling up in crowded housing during this crisis. Unfortunately, not paying the rent or mortgage has very real consequences. Landlords depend on that rent to keep housing safe, to pay the utilities, to pay their own bills. Credit unions and banks need mortgage payments to stay in business and keep making new loans. The 25 million rental assistance and 5 million in mortgage assistance being announced today is a step forward to address these serious issues. The partnership, through partnership, collaboration, and lots of people working very hard, funding for both of these programs will be available starting Monday, July 13th. The Vermont City Housing Authority, an agency that manages federal rental assistance programs statewide, will administer the 25 million set aside for rental assistance payments, providing much needed relief to landlords, in some cases owed many months of back rent. The Vermont Housing Finance Agency, an agency that finances affordable housing statewide, will administer the $5 million set aside for mortgage assistance payments, providing some relief to lower income homeowners that could otherwise face foreclosure. Knowing the need is great and the demand for this assistance will be high, technical assistance has been made available through the Vermont Landlords Association to help landlords across the state access this rental assistance program and the Vermont Legal Aid to help tenants and homeowners access these funds. More information on these programs will be available, is available on accd.vermont.gov. Now at this time, I wanna turn it over to Richard Williams, who's the Executive Director of the Vermont State Housing Authority, to provide a little more detail on the rental assistance program. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hannaford. Hopefully you can hear me there okay. My name is uh, Richard Williams. I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont State Housing Authority. And I wanna thank Governor Scott uh, today for allowing us to be part of this press conference. And also I wanna thank you, Governor, for the support that you have personally given us along with all your team members. And I can't say enough good things about Commissioner Hanford and his team there. So uh, today I, I just wanted to begin by, uh, even prior to COVID-19, uh, over half of the renters in Vermont, about 36,000 households, have housing costs that consume more than 30% of their income, the standard for assessing affordability. When housing costs consume more than this, tenants are less likely to have enough income remaining for other living expenses, which can lead to housing instability. One quarter of Vermont renters, about 18,000 households, spend more than half of their income for housing costs. These renters are at high risk of housing instability, which can lead to frequent moves, eviction, and even homelessness. The program we're here today to talk about, the proposal was designed, as it was mentioned previously, by the Vermont Landlords Association, Vermont Legal Aid, and the Vermont Department of Housing and Community Development in consultation with Vermont State Housing Authority. The VSHA is a housing service provider with over 50 years of experience administering complex federal housing assistance programs. VSHA currently serves over 8,000 households and provides over $50 million annually to program recipients 
through direct payments to landlords. We're here today to talk about the Vermont State Housing Authority Rental Housing Stabilization Program. The primary goal of this program during this public health emergency is to keep Vermonters housed, allow Vermonters to keep their rented homes and avoid homelessness, and avert termination of tenancy and court eviction by granting back rent funds. The second goal is to compensate landlords for some of their losses due to the CARES Act, judicial emergencies, and stay of eviction proceedings. The program is designed to maximize the number of households who remain housed during COVID-19. I just uh, quickly would like to go over a couple of the uh, uh, overview of the rental housing uh, stabilization program. So who is eligible to apply? Both tenants and landlords can apply if the unit is occupied. Uh, people or households experiencing homelessness. The grant money can be used for past due rent payments, including past due mobile home lot rent payments. It also can be used for first and last month rent payments and security deposit payments to secure affordable units for tenants. The simple application process, certifications are under penalty of perjury. Certification of past due rent by a landlord by month, simply a rent roll or a ledger. And the unit uh, and the landlord must certify that the unit is not out of compliance with the Vermont Rental Housing Health Code or any health and safety order. If the unit is out of compliance, the landlord will have 30 days to bring that unit into compliance. Certi certifications by the tenant of all household members covered by the grant and that there are, and they also, the tenant also has to certify that there are no known health and safety violations. And if there is, the tenant will allow the landlord access to the unit to make the repairs. All success, successive certification that rent is passed to is, is payment guaranteed provided there are remaining programs. So basically what I just tried to say there was that you can reapply more than once. Uh, applications will be per processed on a first come, first served basis. Uh, calculation of condition of grants. The, the grants are limited to the Vermont State Housing Authority payment standards or the actual amount due the landlord for the months being claimed, whichever is less per household at a single unit. The landlords must waive any late fees, any rent in excess of the VSHA payment standards for months of the grant. The landlord must agree to drop current eviction and pass cause for eviction and the landlord must agree not to evict for non-payment of rent if tenant's application for rent arrears grant is pending for a specific period of time. The landlord must agree not to increase the contract rent before January 1st, 2021. The landlord agrees not to discriminate against the tenants on the basis of race, color, national origin, ethnicity, religion, age, disability, sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, present of minor children, abuse, sexual assault, or stalking, or receipt of public assistance or marital status. The CR funds can be used to pay arrearages incurred before March 1st. The intent of this legislation is to prevent the homelessness and eviction during the March to December 30th timeline and to assist landlords who have also lost income and are facing hardship due to the pandemic given the public health benefit, as well as the cost savings of preventing homelessness, the expenditure is justifiable. The grant amount is not taxable income for the tenant. However, the grant amount to the landlord is taxable. If you are a landlord interested in these funds, please consult a financial advisor for additional information. At the end of the year, the Vermont State Housing Authority will issue landlords a 1099 tax form and the other point I wanted to make is that a certification of legal U.S. residence is not necessary requirement for the rental assistance program. So I'd like to refer you to my webpage. It's www.bsha.org. Also on our webpage, which all that information will be available on Monday, uh, there will also be telephone numbers and contacts for the Vermont Legal Aid, which all tenants can call if they need technical assistance or 
Uh, Want to know how to apply? The Vermont Landlord Association also offers the services to landlords, but you do not have to be a member of the Vermont Landlord Association. Any landlord can call. Those numbers will be there, and uh, and all, also all the other program uh, detail applications, everything will be on the website. So as the governor thank the legislature, I just would like to say, I'd also like to say, uh, thank the legislature, uh, especially the committees of jurisdiction, uh, Commissioner Hanford for the hours and hours and hours that we spent on the Zoom meetings uh, to stand up this program. And uh, thank you, Governor, for inviting me here today. And uh, my next task is to uh, introduce Maura Collins, the Executive Director of the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. Thank you, Richard. And thank you, Governor, for inviting me here today. My name is Maura Collins. I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. We are a statewide affordable housing mortgage lender. But today I'm here because the governor's administration invited us to administer one of the housing assistance programs that he proposed that will help keep Vermonters safely and affordably housed throughout this pandemic. Over 60% of Vermonters own their homes and owe money on a mortgage, and many of them have been hit hard by the economic toll of the COVID crisis. In response, the legislature supported the governor's proposal and awarded $5 million to help lower income homeowners who have fallen behind on their mortgages. This program will pay for up to three months of missed mortgage payments for households who faced economic hardship due to COVID-19 using federal funding from the CARES Act so that these households don't have to face modified loan terms that could make their housing unaffordable going forward. To be eligible, a homeowner's recent current income needs to be below a certain limit, and they must have missed at least two monthly mortgage payments since March. The mortgage must be the primary residence in Vermont, meaning this isn't for vacation homes, and the loan has to have been in place before March 1st of this year. While VHFA is a statewide affordable housing lender that focuses mostly on first time home buyers, this program is not just for VHFA borrowers. This program is open to all eligible homeowners as is explained on our website. Our goal is to help homeowners who've had job loss or income reduction during this pandemic and therefore may be at risk of foreclosure once the moratorium lifts. We want them to remain safe in their home and this grant will allow them to afford to do that. The governor signed this bill on June 2nd and I'm very proud that next Monday, just 11 days later, VHFA will launch our online application process where homeowners can apply for this grant. We'll be accepting applications from Monday through the end of August. Despite the, gen the governor's proposal and the legislature's good work, we anticipate that there will not be enough funding for the applications that we expect. So we'll be prioritizing those who have the lowest income and the highest risk of foreclosure. This program will not be first come first served, but instead be based on needs so we can ensure we are serving the Vermonters who have been hit hardest since this all began. More detailed information for this program is already on our website at vhfa.org slash MAP, M-A-P, which stands for Mortgage Assistance Program. I'm sure the ACCD website will also have links to these programs on their site. You will find frequently asked questions, contact information, and that is where the online application will appear Monday. Interested homeowners are encouraged to contact their regional homeownership center or some other nonprofits we are partnering with to learn more about the details of this program if they need help applying. All information is online at vhfa.org map. On behalf of VHFA, we are very happy to partner with the Governor Scott administration to roll out this critical piece of his overall housing assistance package. Thank you. Thank you, Maura, and thanks for all your good work over the years. 
I'll now uh, have Commissioner Pichek come up and uh, give us the update on modeling for this week. Uh, thank you very much, Governor, and good morning, everyone. Uh, for those who are watching at home, I want to remind you that uh, you can find today's presentation along with all of our modeling resources on our department's website, uh, dfr.vermont.gov, uh, under our COVID-19 resource page. Uh, this week, we will again focus on the data from this uh, past week, uh, and then we will turn to our four reopening metrics to see how they are trending. Um, and last, we will finish by looking at the continued increase of new cases that we are seeing across the country uh, and how that may be impacting the Northeast uh, and our leisure travel map. Uh, over the past week, we have seen uh, 45 new cases. Uh, this compares to 36 confirmed new cases from the previous week, representing a week over week increase of just nine cases uh, or 25 percent. Um, I think it's important, as we've discussed previously, to keep in mind that with our very low case count here in Vermont, uh, even a small increase of the number of cases week over week uh, could result in a relatively large percentage increase, uh, again, which is why we instead focus more heavily on our four restart metrics, which tend to be more stable uh, and more informative for us as we move through restart. Most importantly, we can see that Vermont continues to track closely to our seven-day rolling forecast, uh, and our model continues to forecast uh, low case growth over the next few weeks. I also want to highlight some very favorable trends that we've seen uh, over the past two months regarding the low number of Vermonters who have required hospital care related to COVID-19. Uh, as you can see from the slide, since the middle part of May, individuals in staffed hospital beds or in an ICU have remained remarkably low. Uh, this can certainly be explained in part due to the considerable reduction in new cases we've seen over the previous months, represented here by the yellow line. However, uh, this low rate of hospitalization is also partly explained by the reduction in the average age of Vermonters who are testing positive for COVID-19. Based on a 14-day rolling average, we can see during the months of March and April, the average age of a Vermonter who tested positive for COVID-19 ranged between 50 and 55 years of age. During the months of May, or during the month of May, that range generally fell between 40 and 50 years old with a distinct downward trend. And finally, for the past six weeks, the average age of a Vermonter testing positive has generally remained under 40 years old. This illustrates that more vulnerable Vermonters, at least by age, have done a really good job of protecting themselves during Vermont's restart, and so have the many facilities across our state who house vulnerable Vermonters in nursing homes or other long-term care facilities. So again, while our data is trending favorably generally, taking an even closer look at our data provides even greater reassurance. Now turning to our four reopening metrics, uh, these are all again broadly trending well. Uh, the percentage of Vermonters visiting emergency rooms or urgent care facilities to report COVID-like symptoms remained very stable this week, uh, and today sits at just 0.63%, well below our 4% guardrail. The three and seven day viral growth rates have again held steady this week. Uh, both remain under 1%, uh, and neither is demonstrating the sort of sustained growth that would give us pause. Similarly, regarding test positivity, our rolling average is just 0.5% over the past week, with the daily positivity rate ranging from pretty much close to zero uh, to about 1.34%. All of these numbers well below our 5% guardrail. Um, and just for some comparison to a hot zone uh, in the country, Miami-Dade yesterday experienced a positivity rate of 33.5%. So to give some context on our very low positivity rate. Our fourth metric is hospital and critical care bed uh, availability. Over the last week, we've rem we have remained close to the 30% buffer, uh, but our non-ICU capacity does remain high. Uh, and generally, since our other trends are favorable, uh, this is not uh, concerning to us uh, at this time. Unfortunately, the trends across the rest of the country uh, have not been as favorable. On our national daily infection slide, we can see that three census regions, the south represented by the yellow line, the west represented by the green line, and also the midwest represented by the blue line are all now trending up in daily new cases. 
Additionally, the South has now far eclipsed the daily numbers the Northeast was experiencing during the height of the pandemic's first wave here, uh, and the West Census region is not very far behind. We are even seeing this impact the Northeast to a degree, where our cases have remained generally steady. However, we did see a small increase in new cases week over week of 1.33%. It's the first time we've seen an increase in the Northeast uh, for about uh, a month or so. This rise in cases has also had an impact on our travel map. You can see from the slide that many of the states that are on the perimeter of our map have seen counties move to yellow or red status, while much of the Northeast has remained flat. Approximately 11.5 million people are eligible to enter Vermont without a quarantine, representing a decrease from 13.5 million who were eligible to enter Vermont last week without a quarantine. Again, for New England and the Northeast, including New York, those numbers have remained steady and flat, uh, and it's mostly the states around our perimeter of the travel map that have seen increases uh, located in the south census zone uh, and the Midwest census zone. And I think it serves as a good reminder about how interconnected uh, our country is uh, and how we need to remain vigilant, even though our numbers are so steady and favorable here in Vermont. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Levine. Good morning, everyone. The Health Department continues to follow the Burlington, Winooski, and Fairhaven outbreaks, but no new cases have been added in well over a week. <clears throat> Sporadic cases of COVID-19 continue to occur in Chittenden County and elsewhere in the state. None of these sporadic cases appear to be part of a wider community spread of the virus. As I said many times before, this is indeed our new normal in the COVID-19 era. It is the expected consequence of the transition from stay home, stay safe to our current less restrictive existence. Our steady and phased reopening of the Vermont economy and our lives and the return of visitors to our state. And although we are designing guidance with the utmost care and consideration for health and safety, to allow students return to school and college, this will also be an anticipated, but hopefully minor, result. I know I risk sounding like a broken record, but honestly, this is all part of our new normal. We have come this far and avoided much of the worst that other states have seen, only due to Vermonters' commitment to the four pillars of disease prevention in the pre-viral therapeutics and pre-vaccine times that we currently live in. One, stay home if you're sick. Two, wash your hands a lot. Three, keep physically distanced. And four, always wear a face mask indoors when around others and as appropriate outdoors. And if you don't believe me, just look around the country and the tragedy that is unfolding especially in the South and West. I'm not here to try to strike fear in the hearts of Vermonters, just to convey what the data seem to be showing and to tell you that I am very concerned, disturbed, and upset by what we are all witnessing. Connections are now being drawn to mass gatherings, to easing up on mask wearing and social distancing, to overzealous congregating in settings like bars and social events, and in some instances, a failure to reopen uh, following guidance principles or simply going too far too fast. In some places around the country, a return to stay-at-home guidance has already occurred. From what I'm seeing as a public health official, I would be advising for even more restrictions based on the slope of the epidemic curve and the profound impact on the healthcare system infrastructure that's already occurring in several places. And finally, though deaths have fortunately been a minor feature of the recent surge, there are indications that deaths too are on the upswing, especially in Texas, Arizona, and Florida. While the young age of many of the ill has been protective, along with our new understanding of appropriate 
antiviral therapeutics, therapeutics and targeted ventilator use, there is usually a time delay in deaths that begin to occur weeks later, and I fear early signs have appeared. We in Vermont remain at 56 deaths and have not seen a change in that number for quite some time. I'd like to next piggyback on the governor's comments and speak to the future of testing in Vermont. We really must continue testing at our current pace and anticipate an even greater need for this capacity as we expand routine testing in settings like long-term care, health care, and corrections, and as we see more outbreaks and need to do more contact tracing not to mention the need for testing that the return to school or college may lead to. We very much value our many partnerships in the healthcare system and the community. But I must say that these partnerships will need to become even more robust and sustained to free the health department to attend to outbreak responses and these vulnerable populations, the people who are most at risk from severe illness and death from COVID. This is all the more crucial as we will soon face another flu season, knowing that the combination of flu and COVID infection creates even more cases and could potentially be even more deadly. We're very much heartened by the engagement of hospitals, federally qualified health centers, and in many instances, the primary care system. But we know these efforts will need to become even more expansive and look forward to even further engagement especially in the area of testing those who are in quarantine or who may have traveled or may have been exposed or may work in a field that requires periodic testing. Many have already stepped up to help us in this cause. And we heartily welcome the pharmacy pilots and hope that these can become even more expansive and quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levine. And with that, we'll open it up to questions. Calvin? <clears throat> All right, uh, thank you. So I'm not quite sure who this would be a question for, but Governor, regarding this new uh, rental housing assistance program, um, what's stopping people that can pay their rent? What's stopping them from applying this or applying to this and uh, taking advantage of the program? Yeah, uh, I'll refer to Commissioner Hanford, and uh, he might want to delegate from there. Commissioner Hanford. Uh, yes, actually, I had a hard time hearing the rest of that it, question. Could it, it was. Be uh, I think the question, and uh, you can, you can uh, clarify, Calvin, if I get this wrong. But uh, the question was, what prevents those who can pay their rent uh, from taking advantage of this program when they actually have the funding available to do that? Yeah, that's um, you know obviously there has been. Um, unemployment insurance and other assistance that's been available to folks, um, they may maybe have other needs for those funds. Um, you know, there is a, a proven need for this funding to be released. Um, the fact that they have not paid their rent has certainly been a challenge for the landlords that have to up, keep that housing safe and pay their bills. Um, so there's a dual benefit to this program. Um, I'm going to see if Richard Williams has any additional um, comment on this question. Uh, thank you. I think we all know that uh, most of our Vermonters are very honest. And uh, so uh, I know people are, you know, people have been trying to pay the rent. And, uh, and uh, we've seen some st good statistics that, you know, show people are paying their rent. Uh, but I think we're going to see as this continues, uh, this pandemic continues, I think, you know, people will be stressed out. You know, the, the, the monies that they were receiving will run out soon and uh, they're definitely going to need help. Uh, you know, it is a self-certification. You're doing it under perjury uh, and a landlord has to, you know, certify what the rent is outstanding. Uh, so, uh, I think that's the best I can give you for the answer. We we'll, we'll definitely know as, as we go forward and we collect more data, but uh, you know, we're, we're feeling pretty good that you know, Vermonters are really trying hard uh, you know, to, pay their, to pay their rent. And just a quick follow-up, 
world. So, <clears throat> so much of this, of course, deals with the eviction moratorium that we have going on. Um, when, I guess, will we know, or when will that uh, be lifted? Um, you know, I'm trying to recall, uh, and uh, I'm not sure that I have a general counsel on, and if there's anyone on the line that can uh, help me with this, but. I believe that it would expire uh, when the executive order expires. I don't think we put a time frame on the, on there other than uh, we can uh, uh, we can choose not to include it uh, when uh, when we renew the executive order, or uh, we can continue to uh, to have it included. Uh, but we haven't made that determination at this point. Governor, I might be able to help you on that. Sure. Uh, it's 30 days after the executive order uh, ends uh, that you can begin an eviction for non-payment rent. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Thanks. Uh, Governor, can you give us an update on the um, applications for the economic recovery grants that uh, Mr. Goldstein spoke of on Tuesday? Yeah, I believe we have either Secretary Curley or uh, Commissioner Goldstein on the line uh, who might be able to yes, give us a, an update at this point in time. Yes, I'm here. Uh, I didn't get a whole question. Uh, the, the, qu the question is uh, about an update. Uh, you had given us uh, on Tuesday uh, an update on the first two days or first day. And uh, maybe uh, you could give us a little bit more. I believe the number of applicants has dropped off a bit mm -hmm. since then. Um, quite dramatically in some respects uh, from the from the first day but I know they had another I think they had another webinar yesterday or yesterday yeah. um, afternoon so maybe you could give us an update on where we are with the grants that would be great I'd be happy to um, we've had uh, 2200 applications that have been begun and um, we have about 357 that are uh, in queue to be approved. Uh, we've approved 138 of them already. Um, so in total, there's about $30 million worth of ask, um, but we are steadily in, uh, approving. So there's about $4 million worth that have been approved. So there's still significant amount of money left. Um, just to be clear on this queue, we we do have a number that are waiting for review. We have a very uh, manual process of review. We have to review each and every application and it gets submitted for approval. So it's been, uh, it did drop off from the first day, but I can't say it stopped off that specifically. There is significant amount of work uh, still going on to process each and every one. I don't know if um, Craig or Doug uh, are you on the line? Uh, maybe give an update from the tax department. Yeah, I'm here, Governor. Uh, Craig Bolio from the tax department. Uh, so we've had about 1,400 applications, a little more than 1,400 applications since, uh, since the start of the week. Um, we are currently uh, making sure that our back end process is able to handle all of those, and we anticipate uh, starting our review next week. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. All right. Um, and, Governor, is Oh, we're at fifty percent with restaurants now. Is it your intention to to keep it there for a while? Is that essentially as high as you are comfortable going, given what Dr. Levine is? Told? Yeah, you, you know we're in this for the long haul, and uh, these, uh, in some respects, um, we will make adjustments as time uh, moves on, and hopefully things will get better. Um, but what we're seeing nationally does give me some pause uh, as to, to what happens when you open too quickly. Uh, we've been fortunate here. I've been listening, obviously, to Dr. Kelso, Dr. Levine, uh, trying to uh, determine our reopening plan based on the science and the data, and we've done, we've done pretty well. We're right now, which is pretty amazing uh, in some respects, uh, the number of positives we have uh, in, uh, in Vermont is third in the nation uh, right now. Uh, Hawaii is number number one, Alaska is number two, uh, and Vermont is, is third. I mean, we we surpassed uh, Montana, as a matter of fact. So, uh, again, we're doing well, um, but uh, we need to continue to move along the same track and and and, and be uh, very measured in what we do. So, uh, I know there's a lot of pressure uh, to continue to reopen, 
uh, but I don't want to end up in the same position uh, that other states are, uh, like Arizona and Texas and Florida. Uh, we've uh, our plan is working, and we need to move forward uh, again in a very measured way. We'll keep it here for a while. Well, we'll see. We'll go, you know, week to week, uh, actually, uh, and uh, we'll make determinations as we move forward. Uh, different sectors, we might be able to, to, uh, to. Uh, mitigate in some ways, uh, but uh, but again, it all really depends on the on the data and and focusing on on what we want to do in the fall. Uh, I really think it's important for our kids to get back to school, uh, so we need to do that in a safe way. So uh, again, uh, with the with more of our um, um, college students coming back in the fall, as well as our plans for public education opening back up. Um, I believe that we need to be, be careful in uh, not opening up anything else too quickly. All right, I think we can move to the phone, starting with Ed from the Newport Daily Express. Hey, good morning. Um, my question comes from several of our readers. They want to know when DMV is going to be opening up for the uh, public. Um, you mean for in-person uh, service? Ed? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Obviously, I just want to remind everyone uh, that we haven't uh, really closed at DMV, uh, just more, uh, from an in-person standpoint. Uh, so you can still do things online. You can still call in. Um, but we, uh, we're working on a plan uh, to open up in a measured way. Uh, we did open up uh, the, the driver license uh, programs, uh, so um, um, some of that has been um, in, in a far different way uh, outside of the facilities. But uh, I might ask Secretary Young if she's on uh, about, uh, about the plan moving forward for more interaction with uh, state employees and how that's going. Um, thank you, Governor. Uh, is this in, uh, the question is in connection with the motor vehicle office. Yeah, it was for the DMV okay. office, uh, but uh, but I thought yeah. you know we we do yeah. uh, we are thinking a little bit forward uh, in terms of of how do we bring back uh, some of the state employees that uh, that are essential for in, in person service as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think each individual agency and department right now is looking at. Um, who they would like to bring back to the work site, how they can bring them back to the work site. And motor vehicle certainly is um, one the one department that uh, is is uh, one of the first on, on our priority list. So the uh, Department of Buildings and General Services is working with motor vehicle um, to set up uh, some safety features, be it plexiglass that may already be in for customer service. So uh, I think those plans are proceeding, and we are finalizing um, work site safety uh, guidelines generally. But, but the big question is um, for each agency and department is who should be returned uh, to the work site um, and when, and who, uh, and as we've said all along, um, those employees who can do their job through telecommuting and teleworking are um, are being encouraged and uh, asked to do so for the immediate future. Yeah, Ed, um, you'll be seeing that it'll be one of it's a priority for us, uh, DMV in particular. Um, so you'll probably be seeing that sooner rather than later. Uh, and I'm not sure whether you had asked earlier, but uh, someone had asked about uh, the rest areas um, and uh, the service areas along the interstate, yeah. and uh, those uh, will be opening up soon as well. Uh, uh, not all of them. Uh, but uh, a portion of them, uh, some of the higher capacity uh, rest areas will be opening up soon on a limited uh, uh, basis. That, that's Thank great, you. Governor. Uh, to add a little more detail, we're looking at opening um, the welcome centers along the borders that uh, basically provide, I think it's up to about 75% of our, our capacity when um, all rest areas and information centers are open. Um, we're going to be having to staff those a little bit differently, so we're limiting the phase one of the reopenings to nine out of uh, 17 of our existing information centers, and those should be uh, up and running um, and online uh, within the next two, two to three weeks. Our goal is within two weeks. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. Wilson, the AP. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I have two questions, somewhat different, quite different, actually. The first one, since Vermont started allowing people to visit from other states without quarantining the list of counties that, that is now, I guess, shrinking, has, has Vermont noticed a, uh, an increase in the number of people from those areas? And secondly, and this is a question, I guess, for Dr. Levine, uh, every day when the uh, number of new cases are published on your website, they seem to vary dramatically from day to day. Like today it was five, and yesterday it was 15, and it goes to three. And is there anything to be read into that? And it's just, it, I would have expected it to be a little more even, and it's not. And those are my two questions. Um, yeah, I'll try and answer the, the first one. Um, we don't keep uh, data on the particular areas, uh, the, those counties that we have opened up and who is visiting. Uh, we do uh, keep an automated type of log uh, determining how many vehicles come into the state. Uh, it's leveled off a bit. Uh, there was a, a bit of an uptick uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Uh, and uh, at this point in time, uh, since the 4th of July, I believe we actually had a little bit of a, a decrease uh, in the number of people. So I, I don't know as we've, uh, we've measured it, I, I might refer to Commissioner Pichak to see if he can uh, answer that further uh, before we get to the second question. Thank you. Uh, so the governor is right about the manual counting of um, of vehicles coming into Vermont. Uh, we also have access to third-party information about mobility data uh, from aggregated, anonymized, um, you know, cell phone applications, uh, user user consented as well. Uh, but third-party uh, applications will show that you know we have seen a relatively small increase of traffic into the state, um, but that it is down considerably when compared this year uh, to the similar time period. Uh, in 2019. Okay. Has there been enough any impact on business or on the tourism industry that's affectable, or is it too soon for that? What was that, Wilson? I didn't hear the question. No, I, I was just curious if Vermont tourist uh, businesses have noticed a difference. Yeah. I, Are they getting more? I I I'm not sure. Um, uh, again, it may be it may be difficult to determine over a short period of time, especially with the holiday weekend and so forth. But uh, uh, but might be a better question for the for the chambers uh, of the world. They might be able to to give us that data. Okay, thanks for the question. Then. Thank you. Hi, Wilson. Second question. Time to answer. Um, I often go to bed at night asking the same question. Um, because we do sometimes go from five to 17 to zero. Uh, I guess to put it in perspective, I would say that keep in mind, we're testing over a thousand people a day. So even if it's zero or it's 17, that's still a very small percentage of a thousand or 1200. And in the bigger context, we've tested over 72,000 Vermonters uh, till this point in time. Uh, so that's even more infinitesimally small per percentage. Um, there are probably given days where we may have a pop-up set up in a particular location because of an outbreak, and we would expect perhaps a few more positives in that location, or there may be a household that all tests positive in a location. So I can partially explain that, but it's really, really very random. And on the days that there may be more cases, they are characteristically well distributed geographically. So it's hard to really put your finger on a particular part of the state that seems to be experiencing more illness than another. So challenging question, um, even more challenging to answer in light of our smaller numbers. Okay, great, thank you very much. Mike Donahue, The Islander. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Dr. Levine, um, we continue to get uh, peppered with questions about ongoing noncompliance with Vermont directives about COVID-19, masks 
gatherings, overflow crowds, et cetera. Uh, but in one case in particular, I was told recently at the Vermont Fire Academy, a training session was held and later one of the firefighters was determined to have returned from an out-of-state trip, a long trip, like a day or two before training and never quarantined. Instead, all the firefighters at the training class had to be notified later about the non-compliance by one of the classmates. And firefighters in several departments had to potentially be self-quarantined because of this conduct. And as you know, Commissioner Sherling said uh, from our police and fire and rescue squads are not reporting their own cases to the state. So I guess the question is, so why should private citizens be expected to follow the Vermont directions when public safety officials across Vermont apparently refuse to follow them or even self-report? Uh, I mean, what can, can you do to bring them into compliance or is this just a lion without teeth again? Hi, Mike. So um, I guess, number one, I'd want to know more of the details, and if you could forward any of them to our communications office, that would be really helpful, because I don't want to be uh, expounding on something that I don't have any details on at all or may not be fully fleshed out yet. Uh, but I do think you make a good point that if our public officials, at whatever capacity, aren't modeling the kinds of behaviors that we are expecting Vermonters to uh, model, they should be held accountable. But I wouldn't want to draw the conclusion that we have abundant public officials that are not actually abiding by uh, all of the rules, which in many cases they have helped and contributed to our crafting. Uh, so certainly I, I wouldn't want our audience of Vermonters to come away from this with the impression that this is a widespread problem because I'm not aware of it being that, um, and I would hope it wouldn't be. But certainly we should, as you uh, imply, hold people accountable. And if there are indeed officials that have uh, not stuck to the rules uh, as we've crafted them, um, we should hold them accountable for that. So you probably read the story in the Stowe report, maybe that, that a police chief went to Montana on vacation for a couple of weeks, came back, didn't self-quarantine, instead he went to work at the police station, went shopping and who knows where, before the town manager stepped in and ordered him to go home for two weeks. I mean, I mean, how many police, fire, and rescue squads have your contract uh, contact tracers determined to have had COVID-19 positive tests or had been placed in quarantine or whatever? What, what do your tracers tell you since public safety doesn't seem to have anything? Yeah, so certainly my contact tracing team has not indicated to me that we have an endemic widespread problem with people in law enforcement uh, who have needed to be uh, or have generated contact tracing because of exposures uh, that they weren't completely upfront about reporting on. Uh, so, But how about any, any cases? I'm not talking widespread. I'm not asking 100% or 80%. Yeah. I'm just asking. What, what have they told you? I mean, yeah. two, three, four apartments or what? They have not told me anything, and I've not asked the question because it hasn't come to our attention that it's been a significant problem. But you will be asking that today, probably. Well, I think you've publicly asked it, so we will see if we have any data to support that. Great. Thank you very much. Kat, WCAS. Hi. We've seen a lot of talk both locally and nationally about what happens in a month and a half when schools are set to go back. And I know our goal here is to send kids back to school in person, but we are planning in case remote learning is needed. We are seeing some school districts here consider doing some mix of the two, the in-person and remote learning. I guess my question is, what is the state doing to address the ripple effects of those decisions? Like when a parent can't go to work for some percentage of the days for the whole school year because their child has to learn from home. This I ask from questions I feel there, particularly from working moms who are really nervous about the impact that this will have on them. And some are kind of feeling caught between this idea like you can't have a job or an, and a child during this pandemic, you know, because you're forced to choose between them. Um, so maybe I'll start with um, Secretary French. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Kat. Um, 
in terms of uh, sort of we're calling a hybrid approach to learning, which includes uh, the sort of simultaneous provision of in-person instruction and in remote learning, that is something we're reviewing. Uh, I, I originally set the goal to produce some guidance on that by mid-July, and I think we'll be on track to produce some guidance next week. Uh, I wanted to begin by uh, reviewing the statutory and regulatory sort of parameters on which we would enact that as, you know, um, a lot of a lot of what we're dealing with under COVID-19 is uncharted territory, um, and a lot of our regulations don't necessarily uh, match up with some of the, the strategies. I think we will need to employ, including hybrid learning. Um, so I think you know at this point, I'm totally sympathetic to the idea. Um, my my gut instinct is that districts are going to need to have maximum flexibility uh, to navigate uh, what's in front of us coming the fall. So um, I think hybrid learning is something we need to have in our toolkit. Um, we're going to we're definitely put out guidance uh, next week as soon as possible, uh, so we describe sort of the parameters under which that can be enacted, um, precisely so we can start to give families and uh, school district folks the, the time to start planning for doing. Uh, but it will be challenging, but I think it's the necessary uh, approach uh, for us to have our toolkit for the fall. I guess for you know what would what message would you have, Governor, for the families out there who are looking at this possibility of in the fall not being able to if they have a job that does not allow them to work remotely, and even if quite frankly even if they do because as most parents I've spoken will tell you you know working remotely and trying to help your kids in school are you know not easy. How, what would be your message for them on you know how to navigate this fall? Yeah, there's it's going to have to be contingency plans put into place uh, by everyone individually, collectively. Uh, I think uh, Secretary French has uh, outlined a proposal for, for a hybrid type of approach um, and having just as many options as possible. Um, this isn't going to be easy. It's not going to be perfect. Um, but by and large, I think we have to consider collectively what's best for the kids. Um, what's best for them uh, this this fall and I think getting back to school for in-person instruction is incredibly important uh, to our kids so somehow some way um, and, and again it won't be perfect uh, but I believe this is the right approach uh, for our children and what would be your message to employers who you know, in the fall, we're going to maybe same, to... same deal. I mean, they're going to have to be as flexible as possible. I think we've seen uh, an incredible amount of flexibility uh, amongst employers uh, and uh, uh, throughout uh, employees and employers, and we're going to have to continue. This is a this is a long, long road ahead of us in some respects. This isn't over by any any means, and it won't be uh, until we have some sort of vaccine in place uh, that is safe. Uh, and that is distributed uh, throughout the the, uh, the population. So that's going to take some time. Uh, but right now, in the meantime, um, asking people uh, to be as accepting as possible, uh, to be as versatile as possible, uh, to be as understanding as possible, uh, both from an employee standpoint and an employer standpoint. And we'll do so on the state level as well. Um, we'll get through this, um, but we're going to have to, again, uh, just be just be as versatile as we can. Would the state consider some of the protections that we had earlier this year when the pandemic was, you know, in its height as it were shutting down, parents were needing to juggle child care and if they couldn't go to work in person, they couldn't be fired? Would, would the state consider reinstituting some of that so parents wouldn't worry about losing their jobs if they had to deal yeah, with I child don't, care? I don't think we've ever stopped that, Kat. I think that's still, okay, still in place. Okay, sorry, I thought that had been. No, I believe Thank that's you. still in place. Aaron, BT Digger. Hello. Um, I, uh, I have some questions about the cross-state travel map. I, uh, I had an epidemiologist contact me recently about the methodology for the travel map, and uh, I took a, a good look at it myself. Um, he has a, a number of criticisms. I don't know if I, you know, if I get into all of them here. Um, one of his biggest ones is that he calculated, you know, based on the known percentage of people in these counties that have COVID and the known and unknown percentage of testing levels in these counties, 
the margin of error on the actual numbers uh, is pretty big. And it's quite possible that a lot of those counties, whether or not they meet that standard of 400 million, is really, uh, you know, partly a matter of random chance or even just counties having a better or worse testing strategy. Do you have any response to that? Well, first of all, Aaron, I'm just curious whether this person, this epidemiologist, has a name. Uh, we'd love to, to talk uh, with him or her yeah, uh, to discuss uh, that. Yeah, his name is Dr. Remington Nevin, and I believe that he's also reached out to you guys directly. Um, I, uh, I also ran it through uh, two other epidemiologists uh, myself, and they didn't have any substantive criticisms of his work. Uh, did they have substantial criticisms of our work? No, I'm, I'm saying that they, they agreed with his concern. I see. Um, well, I, I will uh, let uh, Commissioner Pichak answer some of the questions, but, uh, you know, I have a great deal of faith in uh, Dr. Levine and our epidemiologist, Dr. Kelso. Uh, we've been working together, um, and I would have to say uh, the numbers don't lie. I mean, we've, we've had this in place for quite a few weeks uh, at this point. Uh, we're seeing uh, people come to the state, and um, and I can't give you the exact numbers, but we know they're here, anecdotally, uh, and we're seeing uh, the plates and so forth. So, and we haven't seen a spike in in terms of the uh, number of active cases. So, what we're doing, um, and it, and again, may, maybe it's fair for criticism. Uh, maybe we could do it differently. I know other states have just opened up uh, to the whole state without considering uh, such a low threshold as 400 uh, uh, per, uh, per million uh, in terms of uh, active cases. But we took this cautious approach, and I think it's working. And so um, I'll let Commissioner Pichak answer. Uh, thank you, Governor, and thank you, Aaron. So, um, you know, relating to the, uh, the threshold of 400 active cases per million, you know, I think um, that has been uh, proven to be a pretty solid number for us when we've seen other jurisdictions incorporate uh, some level of threshold. They either end up right at near that 400 level uh, or in some cases they're even stricter. I think New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, you know, if they were to apply their methodology to ours, the threshold would be about 650 cases uh, per million, so a little bit higher. The EU implemented, um, you know, recently uh, a threshold as well. Um, theirs is on a 14-day average, so that would equate to a threshold that was lower than ours, uh, about 100, 150, I think, uh, active cases per million. So I think we're right uh, from a threshold standpoint, right, sort of in a, in a good spot. Um, the other question is how do you calculate active cases, and, and that's an open question. There are many different ways of calculating active cases, so uh, it's quite possible that this epidemiologist has a different opinion on that. Uh, we decided to use an approach that um, we are very comfortable with internally, that was developed internally, uh, but we also cross-reference that ap approach, and, and I do this personally by looking uh, at the work of uh, an outside consultant, Oliver Wyman, that also has a travel map uh, that's uh, available online. Uh, they have a similar uh, threshold, a similar sort of uh, way of calculating the numbers, but they have a different methodology of getting there. Uh, and our counties are always relatively in line with theirs. Their numbers are not identical because we have a different approach to the methodology. But generally, the methodology is looking at um, weighting the cases, the cases that are more recent, uh, more heavily, because individuals are more infectious during that early time period, uh, as the science has indicated, and then become le less infectious over time. Um, we've run what we refer to as gamma distributions on that to come up with a number of scenarios and a number of um, ways that we can more confidently understand uh, those numbers. And then we apply um, a multiplier to that, uh, which is basically a number that brings uh, our number up to uh, the average that we've seen in Vermont. So at the beginning of the travel policy, that was a 2.4 uh, multiplier. And, um, and that's basically how we get to our number. Uh, like I said, ours is unique compared to ways that others calculate, but we think it's more representative of the risk, basically weighting the risk heavier earlier on and then devaluing uh, that risk as people get um, through the disease and are less infectious. Yeah, um, when it comes to, you know, the, well, really both the active 
case calculations and the you know decision to make the 400, those aren't necessarily based on you know scientific research or modeling that has proven that you know that as long as it's at that level, it will prevent any kind of danger. Does that make you you know a little concerned that there isn't you know hard evidence that 400 is low or high enough, and you're just kind of basing it off of what other states have done? Well, just to be clear, we were the first to do a travel methodology like this. The EU came after us, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut came after us. So when we looked at um, you know, doing this, we were really the first um, state in the country, certainly, pretty much the first jurisdiction in the world that contemplated this. And um, you know, it's the first time we've had a pandemic of this level in 100 years. So there really wasn't scientific evidence or scientific literature that could that we could rely on and say what's a safe you know threshold that will make uh, certain that Vermonters are not going to get impacted. But what we did do is look at the relative risk. We looked at what were the Vermont counties looking like over time. Where um, uh, what was that number at the time? It was somewhere between 100 and 200 um, uh, active cases per million. So we said what's a, a number that maybe you know is a reasonable number based on that. What's a relative amount of risk that we're willing to accept? And from the beginning, we've always said, you know, that these aren't necessarily uh, safe counties. It's not how we're describing them. We're describing them as quarantine or non-quarantine counties. Uh, so there's always an element of risk, and we've said that uh, up front. But what the county threshold does allow us to do is provide us some certainty that um, if we do see some cases that are imported to Vermont, that we do have testing to flesh that out, uh, and we do have contact tracing to isolate it. So that threshold was designed carefully in terms of, you know, what's our capacity to withstand an increase in cases and what's our risk appetite. But like I said, there really hasn't been an experience like this before, so we really had to um, do some critical thinking and come up with a, an analysis that made sense. And a number of other jurisdictions have landed with an analysis uh, right around ours, so that gives us some comfort. The last thing that you touched on, um, you that talking with him was that, you know, I don't believe this is intentional, but just looking at the results, a lot of um, the counties that are excluded have a higher percentage of people of color than the counties that are allowed to travel to Vermont. Um, so it has a bit of a outsized effect on people of color. Does that concern you? Do you think that it's fair to, you know, kind of make judgments about people just based on where they live and not what habits they're following or whether they tested positive or not? So certainly the, the discrepancy um, in COVID positive uh, and the experience that people have once tested positive is certainly deeply disturbing and troubling to everyone. Um, what I would point out first is that uh, everyone can come to Vermont in some way, uh, whether it's not through, whether you don't have to quarantine or whether you have to quarantine at home. Uh, and then come to Vermont, uh, or whether you have to come to Vermont and then quarantine here. So Vermont is open to everyone. Uh, we just set parameters that we think are appropriate based on the risk of a geographical location. Okay. Um, does anyone else have any comments before I wrap up? Um, I, I might just ask if the uh, epidemiolo epidemiologist um, is critical of other states and their travel policies, or, or is it just Vermont? Well, he's a he's a Vermont-based doctor uh, who's also a trained epidemiologist, so I think that's why he was specifically on Vermont. So I'm just wondering if he he pointed to another state that has a better policy than we do. Uh, I don't think he specifically highlighted one though. Um, I. Don't think that he's gone over them in detail as much as he has with Vermont, but that's you know a fair point. Yeah, it'd be it'd be great to find out because if there's somebody else doing it better than we are, um, maybe we can learn from them. Yeah, that's true. Thank you, Sasha. Seven days. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I have a question about uh, PPP or PPE, rather, um, with cases rising in, in uh, many other states. You know, recently we've seen uh, some national stories about shortages sort of flaring up again of PPE. Uh, does Vermont currently have an adequate supply of PPE? And uh, are there preparations underway now to stockpile more ahead of uh, an, an 
expected increase of cases uh, this fall? Yeah, it's a great question and uh, something that we've been concerned with from the start. Uh, and we haven't been idly uh, sitting back waiting uh, for something to happen. Uh, we've been building our supply and stockpile uh, in anticipation of something uh, happening in the future. Uh, in fact, uh, over the last couple of weeks, I've asked uh, Commissioner Sherling, uh, to, who keeps track of uh, the inventory and who has been building our inventory, uh, to, uh, to bring us up to speed on that. So uh, he did uh, just that even this morning, uh, and it looks like we're in really uh, good shape um, and we will continue to build on that supply. I might ask uh, Commissioner Sherling if he uh, has anything to add to that. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, not much to add, only that uh, we continue to uh, the stockpile um, in anticipation of any uh, twist this virus may give us uh, in the fall. Um, the FNS warehouse continues to supply uh, a variety of, uh, of stakeholders um, in the COVID effort on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and we continue to uh, leverage our partnerships both with Vermont Business and uh, healthcare providers, in particular the UVM uh, Health Network, to purchase uh, the key components of PPE uh, in anticipation of uh, any future need. And I think we're talking um, months of, uh, of supply uh, available at this point. That is correct. Uh, we have, uh, in most instances, we have multiple months of supply. And uh, to be clear with folks, we're, well, our target is to have on hand 180 days of supply uh, of all PPE based on our best assessments of the burn rates uh, of each of the items. Um, we're not there yet. Uh, that is a stretch goal. Um, it's been recommended by various folks that we uh, we stockpile 90 days. We've chosen to double that uh, just because um, you know the, the circumstances change in ways we can't imagine. So uh, we're doing things on the safe side. Yeah, and if I could just take a moment, Commissioner Sherling, uh, Deputy Commissioner Herring, uh, and uh, as well as uh, Director Borneman have been. Uh, doing a, a great, or Herrick, I should say, uh, Director Borneman has been doing a, a great job in uh, trying to make sure that we have plentiful supplies. And it hasn't been easy, as you might recall uh, in the beginning. Uh, we were running out of uh, KN95 masks, uh, as well as gowns and so forth, and gloves, um, but we've rebounded and, uh, and we're continuing uh, to make sure that we don't end up in that position again. Um, just a, one quick follow-up. Uh, Commissioner Sherling mentioned the 90-day uh, mark. Have we reached that at this point? For most items, we've reached that. Uh, one of the nuances there is we're, we're not at 90 days for true medical grade N95s, but we do have in reserve hundreds of thousands of KN95s that could be used to supplement that. Um, but unlike the, uh, the sort of crisis posture we were in 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 March, we're actually measuring those two things separately. So we're targeting actually 180 days of true medical grade N95 masks. Uh, and then we would have a, uh, a another large slug of masks in reserve beyond that. But if you took the two together now, we're, we're getting much closer to that, uh, that number. Great, thank you very much. Steve, NEK TV. Um, hello, can you hear me? We can. Um, thank you. Um, Dr. Levine, when I, when I was a kid, I would ask my father about something, and he would say, answer soon. And uh, soon was a, a, a moving target. Um, a while ago, I had asked you about uh, when we would be testing uh, the nursing home uh, staff, because, you know, these are the most vulnerable population to, to the lethality of the fire. Um, so when uh, when will soon be uh, when it comes to testing uh, nursing home staff uh, specifically up here in the, in the kingdom area? All right, I, I'll take a first stab at that and if Secretary Smith has anything to add, he can add. Um, I believe next Thank week you. at one of our conferences, we're going to be presenting uh, 
a, more of a plan for the uh, long-term care facilities. Uh, but our goal is uh, within the month of July to have um, uh, progress made on all of the long-term care facilities testing. The way testing works is it allows a facility to, um, in a phased manner, uh, reopen in that sense. Reopening doesn't mean as much in these kinds of facilities as it does in the economy. Here it means things like perhaps having residents of the facility be in the same dining room at the same time, even if they're not close together, or have another type of activity occur that up until this point in time could not happen. Uh, so it's easing of restrictiveness uh, that testing the facility would help with because of the uh, lack of COVID presence. Okay, regarding the, uh, they just mentioned the KN95 mask versus the, uh, the, the N95 mask. Are the KN95s like electrostatically charged to uh, pick up the viruses like the uh, N95s, the kosher N95s are? So my understanding, and uh, Commissioner Sherling can uh, pipe in, um, generally when we use the K in front of the N95, it means it was not produced in the United States. Quite often it was produced in China or elsewhere. And though they are routinely by the FDA uh, evaluated, and in fact when they come into Vermont, um, we work with the UVM Medical Center to evaluate them, uh, they may not meet the same exact specifications of an N95 as we know it in this country. So we always have to determine, does it actually meet the specification that was advertised before it arrived, um, and uh, could it be used uh, on the front lines with uh, reassurance and safety in mind? I see. Um, and, uh, I I'll just add uh, to, I'll just add to Commissioner Levine's description that uh, there's three levels of assessment. There's a, a, an assessment of the specifications before an order is made for KN95. Then uh, when they arrive, they're sent to the UVM uh, Medical Center for testing. And, there, and then they go into two buckets. One, could they be used as a viable replacement for an N95 in an emergency circumstance under emergency use authorization by the FDA? Uh, and then uh, the other bucket being, if they haven't quite made um, that cut, we, can we use them for something else like replacement of a surgical mask or just a general mask? Uh, and then a secondary test is done uh, for, for the ones that have met the uh, initial threshold uh, for replacement of an N95 and out-of-state testing is done before they're, they're finally put into, not into service necessarily, but into uh, the, uh, the, the supply that could be used in an emergency down the road. Great, thanks Mike. Could I have a quick one for uh, for Mr. Smith? Uh, Dorian? Yes, quickly though. <laughs> I'm sorry, I missed that. Go ahead, Steve, but just quickly, because we're only- All right, thank you. Uh, thank you. Regarding the, uh, regarding the attempted suicide up here at, at Newport, um, there seems to be a bunch of questions we've got that uh, this man was placed in segregation, uh, AKA the hole, where they're, uh, where they're not being watched, even though he had a, he had a history of like psych problems. And, and he, while he was awaiting uh, a bed down in Brattleboro, um, is, is, there a, is there a reason you can give for, for why, this, why this guy was not being watched? It's my understanding, Steve, that this, um, this individual was on a 15 minute watch and according to the preliminary investigation, he was being watched uh, every 15, uh, checked every 15 minutes. Now, you describe it as a whole, he was in quarantine because he was a new prisoner coming into the system. Quarantine means that we are making sure that it's segregated from the rest of the general population because as you know and as you're aware, we have had various instances of people that have tested positive for COVID-19 coming in in the intake process in our system. So he was in quarantine. In terms of the Brattleboro retreat, it's my understanding that his lawyer wanted him uh, to be taken and was attempting to have him move to the Brattleboro retreat. The uh, Department of Corrections had no 
no court order to move him or no court evaluation order for him during that time, according to what I have been told. So just to clear up those sort of instances. All right, but if he had a history of psych problems, why was he given, why was he allowed sheets instead of a padded blanket? The, I don't know about his history of psych problems. I don't know if the court had ruled a psych evaluation as it was, as he was appearing, but he was under 15 minute checks and he was in quarantine during that time period. All right, great. I have a bunch more, but there's a lot of people waiting to talk to you folks. So I guess I'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Greg, the County Courier. Hi, Governor. I'll be quick with this. Governor, I think you're off the hook. I think this is likely for Dr. Levine. Yesterday, Planned Parenthood made an announcement that they'd be changing the way they were going to do STD and STI testing so that they could do it, so that people could do it at home. They also said that STD and STI rates are on the rise and they attributed part of that to losing contact tracers to the public sector, such as the health department for COVID testing. Has the state of Vermont taken contact tracers from Planned Parenthood? And kind of a secondary question, are you aware of any measurable statistics in Vermont that would indicate if STDs or STIs are on the rise or fall? With regard to your first question, you're implying that Planned Parenthood employs contact tracers. And I'm not so sure about that. We have our own contact tracing workforce, so I don't think it's been robbing Peter to pay Paul by any means. With regard to the second part of the question, I'm going to have to look at our latest data because I've not seen our latest data on the time course and trends in sexually transmitted infections. So I don't know the answer. We'll have to check into that. So just for clarification purposes, if somebody tests positive for an STD or STI in Vermont, is it the health department that does contact tracing? Yes. So has the health department taken some of the people that were designated with STAD and STI tracking and moved them purely to COVID tracking? Is there less workforce doing the STD and STI tracking, I guess is what I'm curious about. Yeah, no, I hear what you're getting at. Clearly, it's all hands on deck with the pandemic, but that doesn't mean we're not doing things that we would normally do as part of public health. I'll get a formal answer to you to be sure that there's been no major disruption in those services. But I can tell you right now that we continue to do some of the traditional work. It doesn't just disappear because of the pandemic. But I'll get a more formal answer back to you. Okay, I appreciate it. You have a great weekend. We'll chat again on Tuesday. Thank you. Brittany, Local 22. Good afternoon. Just a quick question. We had a couple of viewers call in in regards to summer camps and how they're operating. Specifically, there's a summer camp in Rutland that our viewer is telling us about that, you know, the kids are not wearing masks, they're not social distancing, and then they'll go into stores around the area. And, you know, everyone in the town is kind of freaked out about this. And that's just one example. And then we have another viewer who called us about a summer camp in South Burlington. Same thing. You know, kids are not wearing masks. They're not social distancing. There's about 100 kids. Kind of acting like, you know, there's not really a pandemic. So I was wondering, first off, if you have heard of any of these complaints. And, two, is there any kind of check system for summer camps? Or do we need to relook at the guidelines or anything like that? Yeah, I'm aware of the situation in Rutland. 
um, and is a, a source of controversy uh, revolving around a camp that was set up in a Holiday Inn. Um, so we are on that and uh, actively pursuing um, what um, we, we believe that there's uh, too many uh, at the camp for the facility uh, because of the 50% lodging limit. I'll ask uh, Commissioner Sherling if he has any updates there and maybe uh, Secretary Smith if there's anything on another facility that I'm not aware of in South Burlington, I think you said, Brittany? Yeah, it was South Burlington. Good afternoon, uh, Brittany, Mike Sherling. Um, we, as the governor indicated, we're following up uh, in collaboration with uh, the Division of Fire Safety, the Department of Health and the Attorney General's Office to try to bring uh, Rutland into compliance. I'm not familiar with the South Burlington uh, situation. Um, in general, I would say that as uh, as reports of non-compliance come in, uh, various state and local entities go out in the educational posture to uh, try to ensure that folks are first aware of the, the nuances of the sector guidance and, and then uh, uh, to ensure that they're, uh, they become compliant if they're not. For anyone listening, I would uh, encourage you to go to the ACCD website to to see the nuances of the various sector guidance, including um, what is required of summer camps. Brittany, this is uh, Mike Smith. I have not heard of the South Burlington situation. We will look into it. Okay, Th thank you so much. I appreciate it. Joe Barton Chronicle. Hello. Um, We've gotten some questions from people who were surprised um, that they were charged, or at least their insurance was charged for COVID testing. Um, and one of the people um, had a family member who was um, not going to be tested because they were not sure they could afford it. Um, is there any information you could provide that would either provide reassurance or um, confirm their, their concerns? Yeah, I'll have uh, Commissioner Pichek first uh, answer that. Uh, so thank you for the question. We have, as you probably know, issued a mandate that um, COVID testing uh, not just be covered, but be covered with no cost share under commercial insurance. Uh, there is a possibility that, so basically anybody that gets their insurance through the exchange, through the ACI exchange, that would apply for them, whether it's a small business or whether it's individual. Uh, there are some organizations that are exempted uh, from state mandates because they are under ERISA. Um, and if that were the case, it's up to the employer uh, whether they're going to um, uh, cover at zero cost share. But what I would recommend um, is certainly for those individuals to reach out to our department, our consumer group uh, at the Department of Financial Regulation and our insurance division, um, because at least the coverage of the test should have been there, if not the full cost, so that there was no deductible. So uh, we'd be really interested in learning more about that. Thank you very much. I have one other question, and this goes back to the attempted suicide at Northern State. Just to be clear in my own mind, um, was the person in question being housed in one of the um, separation cells that are up near the um, uh, near the near the central guard post in uh, the main building? Um, I know there are a row a row of them that people coming into the facility normally spend time in for a period before they're housed with other people. And, and is that where this gentleman was uh, being held? Let me check on the precise location of the quarantine unit. Each, each uh, facility has a quarantine unit now uh, based on COVID-19 so that we can quarantine intakes coming into our system to make sure. But let me check with corrections and get back to you on that the precise location of that person's cell. I very much appreciate it. Thank you. Pete Hirschfeld, VPR. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. Governor, according to your latest uh, campaign finance disclosures, you spent uh, $50,000 
um, on Optimus Consulting. I'm, I'm hoping you can talk about exactly what services or products um, you purchased and, and the purpose for doing so. Yeah, we didn't really actually purchase anything. It was a contractual relationship that we had with them, and it was another payment on that, uh, unfortunately. Um, we, had, uh, we had thought we were going to be in the midst of a, a campaign cycle at this point in time. So it was just a payment that was due, so we're not, we're not receiving any, um, any goods and services at this point. Um, thank you. And uh, Commissioner Hanford, are there any income eligibility thresholds for this rental assistance that's going to be available? Uh, there, there uh, is some rental um, income uh, eligibility requirements. Uh, the rent can't be above the Vermont State Housing Authority standards, which uh, means these rents are, are reasonable, affordable rents. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Richard Williams for actual household income verification. I think that's one of the components of this program that we um, wanted to keep um, quick, simple, and moving forward. So, Richard, can you? answer that question in more detail? Sure, uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Um, the answer to that is uh, we, we are not verifying the tenant income, um, but we do, as, as the Commissioner mentioned, there are payment standards uh, not to exceed. So uh, let me just give you an example, if that would be helpful. For example, the Burlington, South Burlington area for a two bedroom apartment would be $1,464. Compared to the, like the Washington County, which is $1,199. So the payment standards recognize the various differences in the rental cost uh, throughout Vermont. But the answer to the question is no, we're not verifying uh, income. Anyone can apply uh, for this uh, rental rearage money. And, and the, so the only requirement then is that rent be passed due? Correct. And the, uh, the unit has to be occupied. So if the, so if the tenant has left the unit, the uh, landlord is not eligible uh, for this uh, funding. So um, the, the unit has last, the unit. Yeah. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I apologize. You, you please. I was just going to say that uh, the unit has to be occupied, the unit has to meet uh, from rental health uh, codes, uh, rental housing codes, um, and the landlord must submit uh, a copy of the uh, his rent row or ledger uh, showing how much is delinquent uh, to him, and the tenant also confirms the amount of money uh, owed uh, to the landlord. And then finally, if more is still on the line, um, what is the income uh, eligibility threshold for the mortgage assistance? Yes, uh, the legislature wanted us to target it as a percentage of area median income. And at the same time, we were looking for um, simplicity. So we went with a statewide limit, except Chittenden County has a different limit. Again. As Richard said, appreciating that Chittenden County's markets are a bit different. So we're looking at the last 90 days of income, knowing that this COVID crisis, we wanna target people who've really lost their jobs recently or had income reduction. So the last 90 days, you have to have earned less than $15,000, or in Chittenden County, it's $18,000. So the equivalent is five or $6,000 a month in, as an income limit. And I just want to clarify that for ours, the payment goes directly to the mortgage servicer. So there was a question earlier about um, uh, the checks and how do we know that people are going to be honest with this. I agree with Richard Williams that in general, Vermonters in the affordable housing programs we work with are exceedingly honest and there is little to no cases of fraud. If we're the mortgage assistance programs, any assistance received will go directly to the mortgage servicer, which will be, we will communicate with the servicer and make sure that, that is applied to the mortgage payment so that the money goes directly there to achieve its intended purpose. Thank you all. Ann Wallace Allen, um, BT Digger. Hi, um, following up on those questions, I was, I was uh, wondering if I could ask Josh just for a little con Josh Hanford a little for a little context on um, 
any other housing assistance that has gone out during this crisis. Um, is this sort of the first, the first state assistance that has become available? Yeah, thanks for the question, Anne. Um, mm -hmm. You're correct. This is the first assistance for Corona relief funding assistance uh, to go out um, directly into the hands of folks that need it in, in Vermont that I'm aware of. Um, you know, there's talk of other federal um, housing funding, but it hasn't arrived here yet. Um, just want to be, you know, careful to, to point out that there has always been ongoing rental assistance programs, which Richard's organization runs, um, but those often have long wait times and are, are ongoing and permanent. And, and so this is really the first uh, corona relief funding assistance in the housing world going out. And we've looked across other states at what they've done, how much uh, money they put into similar programs. And, you know, we found some states that have done a lot less and some states that have done a little more. And we felt that uh, the, the percentage of assistance and the design of these programs was right in, in a, a sweet spot um, from what we've looked at across the whole country. Do you guys have any idea how many people it might affect? Um, yes, we had some initial statistics on that, and the, the numbers have changed a little bit as far as what exactly is available. And of course, um, depending on how many months of assistance someone receives, uh, you know, a landlord, if it's one month versus four months, and, and same on the mortgage side, will determine how many people, different households actually receive this assistance. Um, I think Richard and Maura both have sort of an, an estimate of sort of an, an averaging, if you will, of, of the number of households this can help. So I'll, I'll ask them to, uh, to, to elaborate. Thanks, Josh. Uh, thanks, Josh. You want me to go first, Josh, on that, or is more? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Richard. So uh, there's. Uh, We've seen uh, different statistics. Mm -hmm. In Vermont, there's roughly about 85,000 low-income uh, household renters. And we've been predicting, you know, potentially 10% of those could be delinquent. So approximately maybe 8,500. We've seen some high numbers. I know Josh, uh, excuse me, uh, Commissioner Hanford uh, uh, and the governor's proposal was looking at approximately 13,500 households. And we've also seen reports uh, published by the uh, Federal Home Loan Board that it could be as high as 21,000 uh, Vermonters that could be uh, seeking rental arrearage. So, uh, sorry I can't answer specifically, but you know, until we start to see data, uh, that's sort of the high and low that we're looking at. And, and this is Maura, for the um, mortgage assistance program, we know from census data that there are over 45,000 homeowners in Vermont with mortgages whose incomes roughly fall under the limits that we've set. And we also know that several uh, mortgage lenders have reported anywhere between 7 to 10 percent of their mortgage portfolio has households who've taken advantage of the forbearance agreements that are available to a lot of mortgages due to the COVID crisis. So we are thinking, uh, and we'll know more as of Monday when the application is open, but that out of the 45,000 eligible households, if 10% apply, that's when I say things like, I don't think that the $5 million, while we're very happy to move it forward and it's going to help many Vermonters, I'm not sure it's gonna be enough to meet the full needs. Got it, thank you. If I could follow up on that uh, one more, uh... In early April, the, uh, there was about 600 pending uh, court cases in Vermont court uh, for delinquent rent. Uh, we're hoping with our program that we can clear those, uh, working with Vermont Legal Aid and Vermont Landlord Association, uh, so we can clear those and uh, uh, make it a little bit easier on the courts and the judges. So you think those 600 pending court cases um, were COVID-related in early April? Uh, they were. Uh, as I said when I uh, spoke about this program, uh, it doesn't have to be exactly COVID related. There could be a rearage. Uh, and the idea is that we don't want an eviction 
between the uh, the first of March and and the end of December. So it, it would be eligible to participate in this program. Um, and that falls within the guidelines of federal funding that you guys are using. Yes. Yes. Uh, we've had an opinion on that, a legal opinion on that. You know, I could add that you know, with the eviction moratorium um, that was put in place early on, you know, many of those cases were uh, you know pending before the pandemic started, and it essentially froze those from going forward. So there is a nexus back to the to the, to the pandemic and the uh, um, effects of it. Um, and Richard's right that the uh, opinion here was that thrusting someone into eviction and possible homelessness during this pandemic from past due rent is eligible because it is a nexus to COVID. Um, was that Commissioner Hanford? Yes. Yes, it was. Thank you. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes, good afternoon. Could you uh, briefly speak on the legislation that uh, you've signed, Governor, uh, recently, S35 and um, H966, excuse me, S350, and H966 regarding um, funding to help small businesses in Vermont. Um, <clears throat> Chris, are those all, I don't, I don't recognize all of the numbers. Are those all COVID related um, recovery bills? Uh -huh. Yes, they are. They are supposed to help businesses who had financial difficulties through, in the, uh, through COVID. Yeah, I mean, we've, We've enacted, as we uh, spoke about earlier, um, we've uh, we put those into place, uh, and those have been activated, uh, taking ac applications as of Monday, um, and we've seen uh, quite a number of people and entities that have signed up, and will continue to evaluate and put money out the door just as quick as possible. Um, from my standpoint, again, um, we need to do everything we can uh, to help protect these businesses, uh, because uh, without the businesses, we'd uh, they don't provide the jobs uh, that are much needed. Uh, we still have 40 or 50,000 people on uh, unemployment or, or the PUA uh, system at this point in time. So uh, the quicker we can get uh, these businesses back uh, in, uh, in order and uh, to keep them uh, at, at least uh, in a survival mode uh, so that they can provide the jobs necessary when we work our way out of this. Okay, great. Thank you. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. Just uh, following up on that, the PUA and the federal um, assistance to the un unemployment insurance is going to run out to $600. As I understand, at the end of this month, which is happening pretty quickly, and as you mentioned, there's about 41,000 people still on unemployment. Then you have, of course, the, the housing assistance, which been a big part of this discussion here. Uh, that's going to be a, if that extra $600 a week for all those people runs out in just a few weeks, it's really going to hammer the economy. Is, is there, do I have that right, first of all? And second, is there a plan B to uh, make up for that, either here or in Congress? Are you you're aware? Yeah, the, the $600 uh, does, end, um, does end at the end of the month. Um, it is concerning uh, because I know a lot of families are counting on that for a lot of their expenses. Um, I have heard, um, I had a, was on a call uh, yesterday with the National Governors Association and there was mention uh, that there is uh, some talk about uh, the possibility of, of having uh, some portion of that. Uh, they don't believe that it would be the $600, but uh, maybe uh, another appropriation uh, to help fill the gap. So. Uh, time will tell. Um, they um, uh, probably a, a good, great question for the congressional delegation, maybe the Senate in particular, uh, in determining what uh, what they're seeing and uh, whether they can do this before the break. Is there? I know the uh, the uh, unemployment trust fund is is well funded now, but that could you know there could be a big impact. I'm wondering you know if there's any modeling or planning regarding you know, starting on August 1st, how to deal with this or not. Yeah, it, you know, in terms of uh, the PUA will continue, uh, as I understand it, uh, through the uh, end of the year. And uh, so our unemployment uh, trust fund, the PUA is funded by the federal government. 
uh, the, uh, the traditional unemployment is uh, through our, our trust fund. Our, our trust fund is uh, still relatively healthy. Uh, it's not uh, down, uh, I believe we started out with a little over $500 million. We're at like $324 million now. Uh, we've tried to take a look outwards. Uh, Commissioner Harrington may be on the line now, and uh, but I've asked him to to determine, you know, if we continue with the present burn rate, uh, how long can we go? Uh, it's a concern, but I think we're we're in a much better position uh, than many other states, as you remember. I think it was early on, about two months ago, I believe California had already had to take out a loan from the federal government to supplement their unemployment trust fund. So we're nowhere near that at this point in time. And uh, with any with any luck, uh, and uh, continue with the strategy that we we've imposed, that we'll make it through this uh, without uh, without going to the federal government for a loan. Mr. Harrington, anything you want to add to that? I think you were spot on, Governor. Just so uh, the people uh, listening know the numbers, uh, we just released numbers for the week of July 4th. Uh, and for the week of July 4th, we had 39,089 people applying for traditional UI. And uh, that's a decrease of about 3,300 people from the week before. Uh, for the same week, July, uh, week ending July 4th, we had 9,485 people uh, applying for uh, PUA, uh, and that is down about 850 uh, weekly claims from the week before that. So we continue to see, even though slight, uh, we do see reductions in the numbers of people filing weekly claims. As you mentioned, um, the PUA uh, program continues uh, through the end of the year. Um, should the, the uh, $600 SPUC program come to an end, uh, similar to what you said, we have heard that there are, are discussions about uh, whether a new round of stimulus money um, may be used to support ongoing, um, we'll call it a, a bump in, in UI benefits. Um, there isn't really a mechanism or the ability for the state to offset those funds. Uh, we do have a maximum weekly benefit amount. Um, so anything additional on top of that um, would have to be from a federal appropriation. Uh, and as you said, um, you know, while our trust fund uh, has declined uh, since the start of the pandemic, um, we are in a much healthier position than many other states. Our current balance as of uh, July 8th was Three hundred and thirteen point one million, uh, and we are doing modeling under a couple different scenarios about how long that could last. Whether we stay at the current uh, number of people filing, uh, or if that the number of people filing continues to drop. Um, as you said, the money um, that is directly attributable to the trust fund are traditional UI benefits. Um, so. Uh, folks uh, receiving pandemic unemployment assistance or pandemic emergency unemployment compensation, which is a form of extended benefits. Uh, in both of those scenarios, um, those are fully reimbursable uh, by the federal government. Okay, great, thank you very much. Matt, WPTZ. Thank you. Uh, this question is actually for uh, Dr. Levine. Dr. Levine, um, it's been it's been hot. You know, it's the summer here in Vermont, and um, you guys have been encouraging people to wear a mask when out and about. And I'm just curious if you have any tips or advice for people who might have an urge to maybe take off a mask. You know, it's pretty hot outside, um, but also you know want to make sure that I'm not exposing anyone else. I mean, do you have any advice for people just wearing masks in hot weather? <laughs> Thanks for that question, because it, it really gets uh, at what we really mean about this facial covering and mask business. Um, it's not so strict that people can't be flexible under circumstances that any normal human being would say these are appropriate circumstances. So we're very strict on the indoor setting, um, and it's often very challenging, unless you're in your own household, of course, uh, and it's very challenging often for people to not stay in an indoor setting for the amount of time that would be safer or not be in a crowded area uh, indoors. 
So uh, it's very, very important there. And when you look at all the studies about what's gone wrong, um, when people are potentially uh, exposed to infection, uh, they can trace it to usually being in an indoor setting. Uh, and so you'd really want to have the covering on at that time. But outdoors, probably the best advice is uh, that you would want to make sure that you had enough physical distancing capability wherever you are. So obviously outdoors is more expansive. Uh, we've restricted the kind of sizes of mass gatherings that would perhaps put you at risk. So as long as you can stay six feet away from other people, you're going to be in great shape. Uh, we do recognize how challenging it is to wear a mask when it can be very, very hot. Um, and so again, uh, we want to be rational human beings and, and understanding human beings who know that best intentions sometimes get complicated uh, because of weather circumstances. But there's plenty of opportunity to still have it on at the appropriate time. If you're waiting in line, for instance, at the creamy stand and not, not everybody is spaced the way they need to be and you're crowded together there, um, obviously, once you get the creamy, you're going to have to take the mask off, uh, but you want to put yourself in a position where you're not in the middle of a crowd while you're doing that. Uh, likewise, with physical exertion, uh, we are very understanding about the fact that uh, you may need to uh, take the mask off because you're exerting, but hopefully while you're exerting, you're not in the midst of a whole bunch of other people. Um, you're actually either running on your own or on your bike on your own or taking a nice walk uh, with a one or two other people that you can be distanced from. Does that help you? It does. You also made me hungry. I might want to go to get a creamy next, but I don't think I can. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Levine. Sure. Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Readers shared with us a recent Facebook post featuring sponsored content from the Vermont Department of Health urging people to wear a mask. I'm wondering whether the Vermont Department of Health is also purchasing ads and sponsoring content in Vermont media that provide local jobs. I'm curious about whether Facebook has devoted any of its resources to covering all of these two and three times a week press conferences. Governor, do you want me to take that? Yeah, why don't you try it, Mike? Okay, um, I guess the best answer to that is stand by. We are in a three-phase um, approach to um, what we call a, you know, a mask um, sort of campaign that I mentioned. We wear a mask, I wear a mask because um, the first phase was social media. The second phase is getting out um, this information through, um, uh, you know, various partners with state government, through state government, um, through uh, all our associates, including businesses. The third phase is earned and paid media. Um, that is coming next week, starting next week as we uh, move forward. So um, I guess the answer is to stand by on that for a local um, local investment. And if I could follow up, what is the plan specifically in terms of putting Vermont tax dollars in the state to support local media outlets? I'm curious why the state would support Mark Zuckerberg at all. And I'd also like to follow up on a letter that the Vermont Press Association sent to the administration seeking to partner with the administration on a mask covering campaign, as well as a get out the census effort. Has there been any um, interest in that? I've been interested. I've been interested in, in the, in the census I'll, I'll let others speak to, but certainly the mask campaign, I'm interested in how we can partner. So we'll follow up on that. I've got Rebecca here who can comment on. Uh... Lisa, yes, we have received a lot of press outreach asking for local ad dollars to go to you all and I have shared the letter you're referencing with our census team. Um, they have a, a marketing strategy plan and we're interested um, but I don't know specifically what if they have an ad budget so that would be the um, hang up there. But it has been forwarded on to them as well as the mass well, team that as Mike just referenced. Thank you. But it seems like if there's money to pay for via advertising there may also be money to pay for traditional advertising 
I don't know that. Uh, I don't know that the census team is advertising on Facebook. I don't think that they're doing uh, paid advertising. Thank you. April Burlington Free Press. Hi, my question is for Commissioner Harrison. Um, we have been hearing again um, this week about uh, so uh, long wait times and inconsistent answers from call center staffers with regards to unemployment claims. And I just wanted to see if you could get just a progress on how that's going. Um, and my second question is also about um, the appeals process. We're hearing that taking a long time as well, and I wondered if you could explain why the appeals process is taking a long time. We heard that some who applied back in March and April are just now being reevaluated for the appeal, and that some people have just given up altogether because they found the process so cumbersome and long. Uh, could you speak to that? Uh, happy to. If I missed something, it was a little broken up, but I think I, I captured uh, the question. Um, with regard to, uh, I believe the first question was um, regarding our call center. We continue to do uh, regular, actually in some cases daily training uh, with our call center. I, I would just point out, uh, and I think I've mentioned in the past, I mean, when we're talking about unemployment insurance and pandemic unemployment assistance, these are some of the most complex uh, programs out there in terms of requirements, uh, federal requirements, state requirements, uh, where you have to you have to compare those two against uh, both federal law and state law, uh, and uh, and then layer on the fact that there are are multiple steps in a process and multiple variables. Um, so it's not always a black and white answer, and um, you know it takes uh, years and years and years um, for our staff to become experts in UI uh, and you know we're, we've asked uh, essentially a call center of um, brand new people to pick this up in a matter of weeks uh, and um, so there are times where the, the information doesn't always match up or people get different answers uh, in many cases uh, what happens is um, someone follows up and does not get the answer they need or the call center isn't able to provide them with the answer, they are added to a, an escalation sheet uh, and are followed up by someone else who may have more knowledge. Um, those do eventually come to our staff and the department and we do regular daily callbacks on escalation logs um, to follow up on, on more complex cases. I'll also point out that you know we also then added two new federal programs on top of these with very limited guidance uh, and built one of these programs, the PUA program from scratch. Uh, and um, that program continues to be molded and adjusted depending on, on the need. Um, so it's a, it can be a moving target uh, and, and the number of variables being considered on each claim um, can be uh, overwhelming at times. Um, and really take some deep knowledge in how the program was built and designed. So um, I do recognize that it can be frustrating for people. Um, we are working to provide regular training uh, to our call center staff. Um, and, and we also know it's, and I think what we're seeing from claimants is that it's also a confusing program for them. Uh, and so what ends up happening is many times due to the complex nature of the program, the information being provided is either contradictory or incomplete, uh, and that also can slow the process. Um, with regard to adjudications and appeals, this is actually a national problem and has come up on many national phone calls and, and work groups uh, that we've participated in, and it's because the adjudication and the appeals process is so heavy in terms of due diligence and fact-finding uh, and providing people with due process in the appeal process. Um, these are quasi-judicial proceedings. They are evidentiary in nature uh, and require um, sworn testimony. Uh, so when, when we get asked, you know, why does it take so long? It is because um, there is an opportunity for fact-finding both on the claimant but also on the employer side 
uh, and these cases go through an adjudication process. Um, I will say that you know Vermont has fared relatively well compared to other states. Uh, I've heard of states that have over 25,000 claims in their adjudication process going back months. Um, we've been able to at least stick relatively um, to a 30-day turnaround. Some happen much quicker depending on the case. Commissioner, I think we might have dropped Commissioner Harrington. Um, we can connect April and, and Commissioner Harrington if need be afterwards. Uh, we have one final question from Patrick at the Rutland Herald. Did we lose our feet? Did we lose? Patrick, we may have lost our feet. We'll connect with April and Patrick to make sure they're all set. Okay. So this is Patrick. Oh. Yeah, go ahead, Patrick. Sorry, I guess I was muted, uh, and I saw they turned it off. So, Governor Scott, uh, obviously we're keeping an eye on the uh, situation in the uh, Rutland uh, uh, Hotel, um, which, by the way, I hope everybody who's on the call realizes it's not a Rutland camp. It just happens to be taking place in Rutland. It's a local, it's a, it's a private uh, uh, owner. Um, my question, though, is apparently this person was there for a couple of days without anybody even realizing there were hundreds of kids in the camp from uh, an area where the, maid, the, uh, uh, the, the COVID rate may have been high. Was there any lessons yeah. learned from the state of how to uh, respond to this type of thing in the, in the future to prevent other uh, large gatherings of people from out of state happening in Vermont without the state being aware of it? Well, again, we'll probably reassess the situation at this point in time. Uh, we didn't contemplate uh, someone coming in to set up a summer camp at a hotel. Um, and certainly during uh, normal times, that probably wouldn't happen uh, because it wouldn't, the facility wouldn't be able to accommodate that. But uh, again, these are unique times and, uh, and uh, someone uh, did, uh, did something that was uh, creative and unique. Uh, but we'll uh, we'll have to reassess and, and contemplate that for the future. But at this point in time, we haven't uh, we haven't seen where that they have um, done anything that was uh, not in compliance. Uh, so we are again uh, looking at the Holiday Inn in particular, in terms of the the 50 percent uh, lodging limitations, and it appears that they may have exceeded that. So uh, they'll have to bring the number down, and then we'll. Um, again, reassess uh, all the other, making sure that they, they follow the rules and the guidelines that are in place. Well, and, and I just want to follow up with one thing very briefly. So obviously, I'm sure you're aware also that the same organization is occupying a space at the former Southern Vermont College. Um, and um, again, my point is not just, is not to imply that they're doing anything wrong. We have no knowledge that they are, and it may be that nobody is getting sick there. Uh, my concern is just that apparently the state did not know about this. So I guess that's my bigger concern is, um, you know, obviously if there's, there's a limited amount to which you can control uh, access from another state, but uh, is there any lessons learned here that to say, in the future we want to make sure at least that we're aware of these things, um, you know, either before they're happening or at the uh, outset? Yeah, again, <clears throat> unique times uh, during this pandemic. And uh, I'm not sure that anyone would have contemplated this uh, going into this situation or in this period of time. Um, again, I I'm not sure that it would replicate in the future, but uh, you know, we learn every day uh, about something that we could, uh, we could obviously do differently. Um, but, uh, but we didn't know about either of these situations uh, before they happen. Okay, right, thank you. Uh, with that, uh, that concludes today's program. So again, thank you very much for tuning in and we'll see you on Tuesday.